listening. Tom, great to have you in the studio today. My friend, it's good to see you. I don't know what's going on, but we got some catching up to do. So you were talking about writing. I was talking about writing because I know you, my friend, are a writer. And uh, what what better topic? Because, you know, there's writer's block, for example. Mm-hmm. And yeah. how do you start to write? And what, what happens in these situations where you get this idea, oh, I'm going to write about that, and then it never happens? Writer's or, block. Net, Netflix and Amazon Prime, that's instant writer's block because you plug in, turn <laughs> on uh, the, the Expanse, and then you <laughs> – you binge watch and New so you don't get any writing done that's yeah, what i do are, you know? yeah yeah i think you've just nailed the problem instant answer uh going to the next question but as a matter of fact i i think you're right we have too many distractions in the world yeah. really we really do and yeah. uh what well, uh, you can be you you can be the couch potato uh, extraordinaire now because with a remote control, your iPad, and your various technology gizmos, uh, you can blank out for the entire day and day you goes by. Right? Send a drone down to Walmart, pick up uh, the milk, and <laughs> that's all you have to do. You, oh, it's, it's you just coming. sit there. We're, we're going to be brains and vats. That's coming. <laughs> and it's going to be not like the old science fiction movie, but it's going to be more of a digital brain and vat. They're going to uh, digitize your spirit, and you'll be out there. You'll be just, experiencing, just, but the physical you will in be. the ether. You're just out there. Mm, okay. It's happening. It's happening. All right, that uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I tell you what, you scare me with some of the things you say about these things. Cause well, I'm, I'm a I'm futurist. Actually, I'm a thinker. Yeah. That's so. That's what I do. That's my job. I'm a former professor, so you know. Well, I, you. I, uh, that I think it's, it's and I still, talk. Well, there you go. It's still scary a little bit when we're talking brains and bats, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, so far, I look around here in Columbus, Georgia, uh, here in the studio, downtown First Avenue, and I'm yeah. thinking, well, we don't have any brains and bats yet. I don't know how fast that you we're know moving. about that we know about. But there's a lot of empty store space down here right now, <laughs> so uh, could be anything happening in Uptown Columbus. You just don't know. Okay, yeah. all right, so, I will. I'll mm-hmm. take that under consideration. Yeah. Well, I, I love the speed at which you answered some of these questions here. That I wanted to take a few moments to go into, but the idea of this Distraction may be the key, um, uh, and the opposite of that is focus, right? So, all right, I've got a topic, I've researched a little bit, I've read a little bit, now I want to write on it. But nothing happens, right? I'm like the Chevy Chase in that movie where he moves up to the New England cottage and he's got a little lake with the ducks yeah. on it, the windows open, he's got his typewriter there, and he types three letters, T H. E. <laughs> and and uh, you, you see the clock going by hour after hour, day after day. That's as far as he's got. And he's got paper all crumpled up around the, the desk there. And he's, that's as far as he's gotten. And sometimes I feel like that guy. The uh, You know, I want to get there. I want to put some thought into it. I want to put some words on paper. But it just doesn't happen and i want to explore that today well, with you and i at want least, you to talk about that. Uh, you may be uh, chevy chase in that movie writing <laughs> t-h-e but at least you're not jack nicholson writing all work and no play makes jack a dull boy yeah that's and, right uh, <laughs> uh, 300 pages of it you remember that shelly duvall finds that here's johnny you here's know it was uh, yeah it was crazy so no, that's some that's that's, some, that's the ultimate in writer's block right that there. is some crazy stuff yeah. and um mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I haven't researched it, uh, th- this idea of the writer's block, but I want to talk about writing in general, too, because I think we can. I, I had um, written professional papers yeah. and things when the university yeah. and so forth, and you have to learn that particular writing style, uh, the the terms of vocabulary that she used. Yeah, the boring in style. Uh, that, the, this is what we most, had to learn to be boring. Some yeah. of the most boring stuff that you can find. <laughs> Uh, but and it goes and and a problem that I really have about that is a lot of times it goes into a journal that journal goes on the shelf, uh, or you, even a dissertation or oh, I know. You know other yeah. writings and it goes nowhere. It's like in your collection you have to do it for tenure and promotion. Those right. Kind of things oh yeah. As you're a professor, but my concern is that <clears throat> it's academic, it's professional, it goes to a very small audience, and yeah. that's it. And so it's almost an exercise that you have to get through, when really I think of writing and 
in a, in a much broader sense than that, but we seem to get stuck there sometimes. You know, it was one of the coolest things, and this happened right when I was first an academic. I I was me, I'm gonna adjust this. I was involved with this group, right? And the group all had uh, published a pretty good bit. I had not published anything except a dissertation. So what uh, this group did is we sort of got this little research study that we were working on, and we published on that over and over again and here's the thing you developed a group voice so no matter who was actually hitting the keys right. it sounded like this individual witty witty saltile and hackett and we all sounded and okay. we would alternate okay. first first author but uh but when i go back and i read that stuff i can't i mean i i you can can't remember discern who who uh, wrote what which paragraph the style all sounds the same it all kind of, so you guys really got on the same page so to speak literally in some ways it was a hive mind it was really cool and and the thing was you'd you'd be sit, i'd be sitting over there at columbus state and i'd get an email from one of the witties and they'd say well, we're presenting our work blah 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 and mm-hmm. a, a lot of my work would be in it but I couldn't, for the life of me, tell you exactly which lines I wrote. I could tell you generally some of the ideas I brought to the table. So that well, was a fun, fun project that we I, did. I, I I remember some of that from um, being in the in the same facility there uh, as you guys were doing some of that, and. Um, I, I was fascinated with uh, – you make it sound simple a little bit there, but I, I was fascinated with how un, two people, much less three or four, get to the point where you're understanding where I'm going with the next sentence because we have somehow figured out that we have this compatibility. Uh, we're on – we believe in whatever we're writing in the same kind of way. Yeah. And therefore, you can kind of write for each other. I, I just find that fascinating. I, I don't know what that mechanism is. It was a window in time, too. And uh, first, all the co-authors really liked each other, and we were all about the same – age more or less and we had the same experiences and uh it was a lot like you know when you listen to old rolling stones stuff you right. you really can't tell which guitar player is playing on any given riff. oh now that's a good i mean comparison. you got keith yeah. richards yeah, yeah. you got say ron wood or you know there were uh, earlier guys too but right. uh richards and wood are the guys that have been together so long and, and I think they finish each other's thoughts. If you watch them on stage, and their classic stuff, the stuff that was really, really good, uh, they were at a you know certain window of time, and I think they were sort of a hive mind. If you see them in a the recording studio, you can see that. Yes, you know, it's yes, really you interesting. And you know, you you tend to think of them. Oh, that's Mick Jagger. That's Keith Richards. But in the studio, they're just some guys playing some music. And right. you could see you could see them ease right. into it and then connect and then, uh, but a lot of times I'd hear a riff I'd go oh that's that's a Keith riff no it's Ron Wood ah uh, okay. that's Ron Wood playing lead no it's okay. Keith playing lead and so I think the the project I did uh, and it was several years uh, the thing I worked on with uh, Jim and Maria Witty and Iris. God, that was just a it was just a blast, and we traveled together. We'd go present together. Right, you get to present. These We'd eat good, right. a lot of eating. We did a lot right, of right, right. you know. That uh, may help. Yeah, so <laughs> we had we had process. a lot of it was a lot of fun. It well, really was. I, I I do find this uh, kind of interesting that uh, the collaborative part of it. You know, we did this whole thing on collaboration at one point, and I presented it actually yeah. on on some of our work at one of the counseling um, associations where. You, you build a team of people yep. sort of like-minded on that particular yep. topic, and then you must have a lot of conversations about things and give and take. Is that is that part of it? Not for me. Okay. Not, not, not for okay. me. It's okay. all about synergy, and it, it, it's really so analogous to playing music, you know? Right. So uh, you – I you, like that. You that see a, a lot, yes. You know a couple of, of musicians, and they're great musicians, and you've seen them play, and you go, I, I want to sit in with them and jam, and you get together, and bleh, nothing happens. Nothing's bleh. going. Right, right, right. And then you uh, – happen to be in a guitar I, I had this experience where i'll be in a guitar store and right. there'll be somebody playing and we'll look at each other and we just start to improvise and i go man that really sounds good hey, it's just a happen? human what's a human <laughs> right. connection it's all about connection right, really, right. Isn't it? it really is um i was listening to an interview with paul mccartney uh 
just the other day. It probably happened a year ago or something. But he was talking about the song Ubla D Ubla Da. <laughs> right. Right. And he got that from a Jamaican friend that he was talking about. He used to say all these cool things. And Paul says, I wrote, you know, took that and made that into a song. But the point was that uh, the three of them were in the studio with that song hitting it and he was not satisfied and mm-hmm. John who he said was typically late mm-hmm. comes into the studio and he says what you guys working on he got all and they said oh the oh yeah i've got this he sits down at the piano and he starts you know with the piano piano back and forth john and did at, and see the, that's and the, exactly what i'm talking and about the three of them just glommed on with him and it's it was a band and it's called the beatles so yeah that's how and that worked that was a great little interview piece, i would have sworn one. that that was mccartney on the piano right you, you know when when the beatles broke up it, it the same thing would happen you'd hear a lennon cut on his solo album right and he'd be doing mccartney and then there's <laughs> a there's a uh, a mccartney song let me roll it yeah. You would swear on his solo album, one of his first solo albums, you would swear that was Lennon. And I, I think it was the same thing. They were a hive mind, and even when they effected their divorce, right, I think right, it was right. hard for those guys. Oh, I think right. it was really – they they struggled with how to be individuals, you know. Well, yeah, and it was at that – type of level that most of us are will never be there when the they Beatles. were the world wow. famous etc but yeah the the ability to key off of each other and maybe you're not having it that particular day you're not bringing it but the other right. person brings it right. in and right. then you're up too and you're all on the same level kind of kind of rocking well i i think that writing if it's like that which i like your analogy then maybe we should take some lessons on how people communicate in mu- with music. Now, sometimes that's a feeling, isn't it? It's just a, it's just okay. That's a groove that you get into. It's I'm falling sure in it's love, bro. I mean, I, I mean, uh, you can be on a date with the uh, uh, greatest girl in the world, but if it's not, oh, if the synergy in there, it ain't happening. No, and there, all of us have had that experience, be- and it's really it's a human connection kind of. Thing. Okay. So, uh, so how do you account for those things? No, you, you can't. Know? You can't account for that. I was just thinking, being with the with the great date that didn't work out, kind of thing, because it's Valentine's Day and tomorrow, as a matter of fact, as we think about it, and uh, a lot of love there. But you kind of go back. You kind of go into this human connection, and maybe there's some love. Maybe there's a, a deeper connection with people who can get to that level, and then kind of take it from there, and make something incredible happen i've had those experiences professionally where uh you know uh when i was in school administration i would have experiences where you could after you had a certain amount of experience you could sense when things were going south Mm -hmm. but what what was really (laughs) really great when you worked with folks with whom you had a synergy to where all you had to do was look across the room and almost read each other's thoughts there you go right, but now right, it's not right. everybody no that not everybody happen. i've worked with i don't know? think it happens i think that's kind of rare these days i it, 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 it's a wish that it would be more common yeah. but i don't know maybe people are too insulated maybe they're just the uh, the they're in their world and they're, they don't have that door open for the other person. However, that might work out. There's probably a psychology there that uh, I'm not making too much sense with. But but the idea that that uh, you can connect to a person and it raises everything to another level, and if you can find it, so it's team. It's building a team. I talk about that a lot. But you got to have the right team to make anything happen. Uh, but if you can look across the room and somebody gets what you're about to say or knows where yeah. you're going, it sounds I mean, really mystical. Level. I'm not really sure. I think Pinker would say, "Well, you have these shared experiences, and you've developed a uh, uh, a almost nonverbal communication style." I think that's what uh, 
uh, Pinker and some of the neuro- neuroscientists would say. Well, I don't know if I buy that. Well, let's t- let's take a take a minute here. Now, here's what I'm pulling out today. Yeah. We're on the web right yeah. now, and this is a little article uh, that shows. There's the up, man. There's the man himself. There, you mentioned Pinker, so we brought him in for you today. So yeah, can we get him on the screen? I would love to have him. Uh, he come looks in. like a young rock star. There, he is awesome. Yeah. Pinker, the the ultra scientist. All right, you giving him uh, some props there, but. Listen, let me. He wrote this article about the single reason why people can't write. Can't so I write. wanted to mm-hmm. to take a look at that. So let's uh, let's take a look here. It, he says for Pinker, the root cause of so much bad writing is what he calls the curse of knowledge. Uh, he defines this as a difficulty in imagining what it's like for someone else not to know something that you know. The curse of knowledge is the single best explanation I know of why good people write bad prose. So, so I'm not I'm not sure I completely understand what he's saying there, but I, I took it to mean that you have so much information available to you now. You and I have talked about this whole yeah. deluge of information and data coming at us. Uh, that 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 incapacitates one in a way because okay, where do I start and what do I leave out? What do I put in? And I'm not sure if that's the reason he's talking about, but that's my interpretation. What do you think? It's a tsunami of information. So here comes the tsunami. Oh look, there's a desk floating in it, huh? What? And then you lose your focus, right? <laughs> so it's maybe that's what he's talking about. I don't know, <laughs> yeah. but that's what it's like for me. I'm like, oh, I'm online, and oh, look at that guitar. Oh, look, uh, there's a new ab workout. Oh, how did they learn that? What's dance skins? I've never heard of that. You know. Well, that that's right, and that's. that's that's the whole in- internet um, hole that you, the rabbit hole and the rabbit trails that you go into the internet. It's like anything. And by the way, let me just say something about these algorithms that pop up all of this information because you clicked on a single item. Right. And in a way, that sets up that tsunami. It may be a small tsunami in a way, but it, it all of a sudden the ads, the other information here, you might like this and um, well that takes you off your task you just I'm gone at that point now I have to work to say what what was I doing oh yeah I want to go back I have to do the self-talk to get myself back to that moment Harari says you have no free will that the algorithms and AI have taken away your free will we think we we have free will and we're making choice but really all those choices are made for us and uh, so yeah, I was reading that, the, oh, by the way that's a terrible problem we need to really talk about that so, I'm not so happy with that idea. so I was reading the 20 uh, 21 lessons for the 21st century and I read completely through it and I got okay. so uh, so mind blown and depressed that I gave it to Bridget Markwood my co-author you know that we're we're I said here read this you'll like it and I was like God let me I got to get rid of this yeah, book mama. is what it sounded like you were it was overwhelmed depressing well and the other book. one's the pinker book about enlightenment it's oh, like yeah. Oh, how many more graphs do you have? Okay, yeah, I, right. I understand you're the prose king, but really, one more graph? I'm yeah, lo- yeah, I'm well, completely lost now. I think know? I think he likes this idea of having evidence to back up what he's saying and proof, and it's in a way I think maybe he likes the shock value that comes along with when he says, "Oh, you're thinking this? <laughs> no, think about it in this way." All right, so so going back to this little article yeah. real quick, yeah. he says, "How can we lift the curse of knowledge?" A considerate writer will cultivate the habit of adding a few words to explain in common terms. So a writer who explains uh, technical terms can multiply her readership a thousandfold at the cost of a handful of characters, the level of the literary equivalent of picking up hundred dollar bills on the sidewalk. I would say Dr. Pinker errs on the side of a lot of that <laughs> so you know right. he's explaining to the point to where i'm like three pages in i'm like okay bro i get it Let's uh, let me get my on. uh yeah let me get the dictionary out and I mean, see if I'm i can not understand a, what these words are here i'm not a smart man but uh three pages of arabidosis and a, and a, 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 a rabbit of chocolates maybe uh no. So, so I guess the point there uh, is 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 something about okay, c- 
consider your readership. Consider yeah. that you're putting words out that may be, and we were guilty of it to a certain extent in yeah. academia because there's certain buzzwords you, you need to use. And, you know, there's a common phrase at the summary of every article, uh, uh, there more future research. We need more research in the future about this topic before we draw a conclusion. There, there's a lot of ways that we can – uh, simplify without being uh, too simple in a way. I, I, it's not really how I should probably say that, but the idea that making it readable is not a bad thing. Right. Connecting with the person that's reading. Now, you're going to have to throw in some new terms, but do that cautiously and consider the impact of a word that no one else knows but you. Well, the first thing, and I, I get, I certainly get what Pinker's saying, and 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 I I joke about Pinker. He's a great writer. I mean, his stuff I love to read it. He's he's oh, yeah. a, a real stylist and a, a real thinker. But the first thing, do you have a story to tell? Right. Are you telling a story? And second, are is the story about you in a narcissistic sort of way, <laughs> and I think a lot yeah, of times try not to do that, right? The okay. uh, the I'm so smart style of writing, and you're so dumb. I uh, think immediately you would never do that if you were going down to the uh, uh, pluck chicken place down below us here on uh, <laughs> uh, Second Avenue, right? You know, you would never you would never engage anyone like I'm so smart and you aren't. No, you. That's not a conversation that human beings beings have well let me take that back you would not want to do that it does happen but the, the idea is you want to communicate with the other person and hopefully you want to have that communication the things that you're saying be understood so there's this interactivity or do you, or do you? because okay, if, you're, if you want to be if you want to be a high priest right then the way to uh, attain a high priesthood is to be arcane and to dazzle people with your great words and arcania and uh, your yes. uh, Latin phrasing and the all the scholars you quote. So, so that that could be a that could be a way to uh, sort of mesmerize the people. Mesmerize. And, that's and, what and it is. It's in, mesmerizing. Oh, look how smart this person is. Right. Uh, because they know more vocabulary. All right. So uh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But so the, what he's saying, I, I think, in this is that the 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 idea of being at least conscious of this this. Um, uh, the uh, phrasing of words, the use of of, of un untypical is that a word? Um, words that people will use to uh, then probably skew your audience to a smaller group when you might reach more and more people by just some plain simple English and this is the way you, uh, or either saying the word or writing the word and then explaining what that means and in the context it has to be in some kind of context or it doesn't make sense well is my writing about you or is it about me Right. If you're talking about the narcissistic side of this thing. Uh, well and and I'm just talking about human communication because it's all counseling. So uh -oh, if, here we go. So if the I, well, you taught me this. I mean, I I didn't know this. I was an administrator. What did I know? But you know, the whole idea that if I make this about you and your feelings, then if if I'm engaging right. you in this conversation, I, albeit till you read it, it's a one way conversation. Right. But ideally, shouldn't it be a conversation? Exactly. Like when yeah. I read a, a, a writer I I love is uh, Winston Churchill. Okay. Because. He's just amusing, you know, and right. I have these these sets of Churchill books, and they're clogging up my home office, and I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> I need to share these, give them to someone, but, you know, I pick it up, and I go back, and I just read a page. There's some gems and, in there, right? You well, gotta just... and I'm engaging. He's funny, but I'm engaging him. Uh, all these years after his death, I'm thinking, sure. hey, uh, eh, Churchill, not so fast. That's sort of silly, right? You know, that's over right. the top. Well, it's communication. Because I think at at, at his heart, as a leader, too, he right. was about communication. It was about two-way communication. He yes. wanted to communicate, yes. but he wanted to hear you as well. Wow. I think, oh, man, you've just hit on something uh, here because uh, – aren't leaders and people of in power and other type situations and uh, don't they need to understand that lesson of how to communicate with other people and, and pull people in and it it 
uh, seems to go awry sometimes when you forget your audience, you forget that the other person is a person and needs to be engaged with you, that you don't have all the right answers necessarily for everything, that maybe you could learn something in a conversation. I don't know. I hope that uh, continues in there, but you're learning. I like your idea of learning, by the way. Yeah. That's, uh, so what are you learning from writing this? I mean, are, are you? Are, are you learning something? Are you engaging other folks? Or is this, uh, y- you know, as soon as you utter the words, I'm a writer, yes, I think Uh-oh. suddenly you it's you've placed yourself. I, I just have never really thought of myself. I mean, I'm no, uh, I'm no Shakespeare anyway. So, uh, but right. I don't think Shakespeare thought of himself as a Shakespeare. I think right, he thought right. of himself as if, if actually he was an individual. Well, I, I heard a, um, a a little anecdote about, uh, I think it was a comedian who basically said, can you imagine being the teacher of, uh, say, the third or fourth grade uh, Shakespeare, right? And so, <laughs> and, and you have to write on there, uh, n- do a better job and so forth and send it back. Yeah. Uh, so is Shakespeare, this the best you can do, Will? Is this the best you can do? Like, <laughs> knees work, you know, that kind of thing. So, I, I, but yeah, and and um, there there is something Thing, a little I, I use the word narcissism been there but the idea that you're sort of self-contained and you can't really relate and connect to other people uh, I think you're going to be not so great of a writer I don't know if that's if that's true across the board but uh, don't you want your readers to engage in, like you were talking about Churchill I mean really that's that's kind of the thing that 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 makes sense for me that if you even engage in writing in any form or fashion, you're writing so someone else can engage with it. That are you just writing for yourself and you're going to put it on the shelf like this? I don't think so. You know, I so think you have to consider these things. I think that that's maybe one of the reasons I like writing in a with uh, co-writers, co-authors. Right. You know, uh, after I, my experience with the with the Witties, you know, and uh, with Iris, and that was so much fun. Right. And then uh, we sort of moved on to other things. Iris did, and the Witties were moving on. So, right. Uh, right. You, know, you know, they were doing other things. And uh, then I became a, a a department chair, so I right. was uh, sort of consumed with learn, gotta, learning that yeah, role. That's right. Yeah. But so my next uh, co-author uh, ended up being Lenore Gillum. Mm-hmm. And it was the same kind of experience. Lenore. First, uh, Lenore and I had a real good synergy together okay. uh, We're really talking about that. and yeah. uh, really uh, really liked each other and mostly we just laughed a lot when we worked on projects <laughs> together and then we get important part that we yeah. get all these kids involved and then she and I traveled some together and presented together and I, I mean it was just a just a fun thing but what I remember honestly I can I vaguely remember we did a project on collaboration that lasted a couple of years. Right. So I vaguely remember what we wrote, but now the fun I had with Lenore and those kids, you know, and mm-hmm, we went mm-hmm. where we go New Orleans, we went to uh uh Albuquerque and okay. you know did right. stuff there. I I remember all the fun and laughter, and again, <laughs> Lenore and I ate good. You know, if we yeah, went so somewhere, sad. it was about it was I don't about know how you we... how you're working uh, into our writing topic, food every <laughs> few minutes. But evidently, that's a big portion of how to do uh, the writing things. Well, so I'm all for that. We we'll, we gotta spend some more time. Hey, I wanna I wanna bring up something, and I sent this to you, and it just came out this week. Yeah, um, and it's from Mother Jones. Um, the idea. Now, that, first, who is Mother Jones? Well, well, they See, are, so this is the first I ever heard of Mother Jones. Right. Well, my friend, uh, you're in for a treat. I want you to uh, okay. take, uh, look this up, right. uh, Google it, as they say. And uh, it is a news publication. They publish, okay. uh, they, they have a Mother June, uh, Jones um, publication. They cover, as it says at the top, politics, environment, crime, food, media, investigation, food, by the way, here we go. Um, <laughs> And they have a, a Mother Jones magazine. Food so, and politics, my two favorite so things. The, this is a group of people who really kept up with what's going on in the world, and they have now, for the first time in 44 years, and they've been going for 44 years as a nonprofit newsroom, longest running investigative nonprofit newsroom. And uh, they've come out for the first time for with a style guide. Now, in academia, 
um, we wrote from something uh, in our particular discipline, in mental health, we wrote from the American Psychological Association. APA, yeah. APA style guide. Now, mm-hmm. that told you how to write in a professional style that would be accepted in journals and be up for review, and you submit that and so forth. And they're very uh, strict about how things are. And professors and people who teach that use that for writing, letting their students write will use it as a hammer sometimes to really say, no, this doesn't fit with the style guide. So it can be used in that way, but it's a guide. So even with that, uh, it's important to kind of know what the rules are. And so in the Mother Jones idea, wh- what they've done here and the first time they've ever published this is a style guide. And take a look at this table of contents. Now, it's not just about grammar and punctuation and capitalization, but it also involves what's going on in our world, in our social media world, in our intellectual and uh, news world. So if if you don't mind, Tom, I'd like to just pull up a couple of yeah, these and yeah. we'll, we'll kind of mm-hmm. see. Now, um, for example, if you just take a look at this very first one, uh, and, and there's no rhyme or reason how I'm doing this. I'm probably going to leave out some uh, really important ones. But take a look at this, and this is one that gets me every time I try to write. Uh, when two people together, do you put and or you use the ampersand? Well, this is the first thing they, they say. Say, use ampersands only in names that have them. Okay, Johnson and Johnson, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. Q and A. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm never really sure when to use the the ampersand. I like it because it's it's short, and if you only have so many characters, you have to type into something that right. saves some space, at least yeah. two letters. But uh, so they're saying, wait, better hold off on that it's, you know, unless it's already being good used for them. I like the word it. "and." It's a lost art. And yes, and abbreviations, well-known acronyms, don't need spelling out even on the first use. Right. Okay, so right. it gives you some examples there. And I found that interesting because it clicked into other things like when you uh, name a company or a university or something and they have, say, the University of Georgia, you write that out. And in parentheses, you would put UGA. And in the rest of the document, you could refer to that right. as UGA. Yep. Well, in some cases, those acronyms, those abbreviations, are f- easily recognized. You don't have to go to that extra step USA, of spelling out. for instance. Yes. yes. United <laughs> States of America, parenthesis, USA. <laughs> Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, parenthesis, USSR. Right? Yes, there yeah. we go. All right, so here's one on, on gender and sexuality. And I'm not going to bore people too long with this, but... But I do want to just make note of this, uh, how important this is, at least from my perspective. And here we are in gender and sexuality. That's a that's a minefield a little bit in terms of getting this uh, correct in lots of ways. Uh, so the the um, the idea here is if it's accepted as a uh, if a source prefers it. Now that goes through a lot of these. For example, if a particular group um, organization goes by this, you should uh, be in deference to that that uh, pronunciation or that writing of it. So uh, you know that's just polite, though, isn't it? Isn't it? I like, think so. Like if I tell you, don't call me Tommy. Right, right. You know, I'm Tom. That's I mean, that's it. my. That's my. I'm not saying that's true because a lot of people do call me Tommy, especially oh, yeah. going way back. But right, right. But if I if I didn't like to be called that, then as my friend, right. Even if you preferred to call me Tommy, <laughs> you would call me. So it's just polite. That, f- right? that friendship may not last too long if you keep calling a person by the name they don't like. Right. I well, mean, that some could of these be a problem. Some of these are just. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, their po- politeness. They're, well, uh, and, and in terms of the gender inclusive and gender neutral idea, uh, use gender inclusive and gender neutral language unless you have a reason not to. For example, instead of policeman, fireman, or mailman, use police officer, firefighter, mail carrier. Now, this goes on and on with these kinds of things, as you'll see in this, but um, it. It may have a, a, a bit of politeness and uh, empathy and caring for another person and what they, they, they feel and believe that you should call them or want 
you to call them. Well, and there's an accuracy issue, too. Yeah. But I'm, I'm of two minds on accuracy because I believe that everyone who's communicating is communicating from a story, a narrative they carry. So uh, so when we start talking about people uh, are engaging in fake news, right. well, to some degree, we're all I, – I would never say fake news. I would always say we engage in a narrative that we live, right? Right. But, but right. At, the, at the same time, to say something's man-made is just inaccurate unless a man made it. Am I correct? So uh, That's correct. So back in, the, back in the day, I think some of us would have rolled our eyes, oh, why do we have to do that? But, you know, if it's a change in, in the interest of civility – or it's right. a change yeah, in, the in, that. in the interest of clarity and accuracy. I mean, the truth's hard to get at, so it's best to be as accurate as we can, right? I think so, and be respectful of people, too. I mean, uh, uh, take the time not to just live in your own world and you start calling things and people the way you want to, but consider the other person. Why not? I mean, doesn't that make for a little better – Life situation. Well, I think it makes improves our planet a little bit, maybe in the I, way we interact with people. Yeah, to your point, I think that's right. I think it makes your life richer to to make life about where others are coming from. Otherwise, you're stuck in in the uh, in you in, in the your, echo chamber of your head. Now, <laughs> and, we're, and in my case, that's a bad place to that, be. Yeah, you don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be there all the time. Let's not spend too much time. But that brings me back to your point earlier of the brain in uh, <laughs> in the vat. The brain in the vat, right? Yeah, because uh, you can't unless you're connected. So. How do you get that information out? Well, you take time to to you know uh, consider the other person and what you want in a relationship. You know, if you want to talk about a topic that I really don't want to go there, I'm still going to give you your time on the platform, right? I mean, that's what I want to do because I feel like that you may get the chance to give me time uh, in the reverse situation. So that sort of interactivity is is important on so many levels. Incidentally, isn't that a great rule for marriage, right? Oh, yes. So here we are coming up with Valentine's Day. I know you and Peggy have been married uh, since you were kids. Uh, 43, really. I think we're coming up on, yeah. Yeah, and Janie and I will be 42. But there's a lot of that kind of thing where – where both partners in that relationship are probably thinking, boy, I'm giving a lot, you know, for what I'm getting, you know. Right, right, right. But, and that's human nature, yeah, right? Yeah, you measure but, that interaction uh, principle. And there's an interactional theory about marriage, too, in, uh, in that way, that uh, if I give you something, then uh, you have to give me something equal uh, in that in that reference. And the transactional you, analysis the Transactional, approach, yeah. it's, it's very transactional in a way, and it doesn't always work. But uh, right, it does, a general no. rule – yeah, that that seems to make sense. So I find that interesting, and the idea that uh, you know w- one of the rules I think I've I've learned is, hey, uh, why am I so upset about this particular thing? Maybe I it, tomorrow, two or three days later, I'm not so significantly wound up about that. So let's bring it down a few notches and not get so upset. So hey, you, we have our bumps. We kind of consider how big a battle is this? Am I going to fight this? Is this a, a war or is this just a small battle as we go on? So uh, let's consider that in a way, too. That's my advice for uh, Valentine's Day so far. Well, what you and uh, Lenore Gillum and Rick Long taught me yeah, Rick. is is this whole idea that uh, if if I'm interacting with you, then it should be about you, right. not about me. Right. And I, I think we have a tendency uh, as human beings. My brother Royce says, quotes a guy who says, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> you know, I think, <laughs> I think that's, a human, that's a human nature thing, you know. <laughs> it's a, and I've, I've probably great. said that in, in podcasts before. but <laughs> No, no, I, think, I don't think I've heard that one. That was great. We're going to pull that clip out for sure right there. Yeah, but but anyway, uh, that if if that's how – everything's approached then you're in for a dull lonely existence because really if you're not learning about others and you're not learning new things then uh, again there you are stuck in a you know i'm, I'm getting off the topic no of, that's quite all right but I, I, and i won't bore us uh, too much longer with this but here's one on the list from the mother jones style guide about social media 
an at, and the at symbol is one too many. So just the at, please, just the at symbol, <laughs> right? All right, so hashtags capitalize each word's first letter, okay? And then italics, wherever italics are not possible for ti- uh, titles, like on Facebook and Twitter, use do- uh, double quotes instead, Pixar's bell. All right, so um, we could go on and on in that, but this guide, I think, is so relevant. Now, let's take a look at podcasts, since okay. that's what we're doing right here, right now, and uh and uh, I think we've been through that a little bit. I was trying to figure out maybe it's uh, I was looking for video and corrections. Uh, let's go a little further here. Uh, advisor, not uh, advisor. All right. So these are these are the kind of things that you need. You do need a guide to um, to pull up and and just kind of before you send it out to the publisher before you get things going. Um, and in this one, they talk about uh, just video online, and that's what we do, of course, and then how to do uh, some of that. But particularly, I think good writing uh, means that we are deleting those filler words that a lot of our stuff is – and I, and I'm terrible at this, and I've done it already – uh, so many times, oops, just did it right there. I'm working on it, Tom, but I'm not uh, not there yet of the ums and the ahs and uh, giving ourselves a little bit of time before we actually say the words. Are they talking about subtitles there, like in a title, like you would say, uh, don't fa- tase me, bro, you know, uh, as, a, as a gimmick that it can be overused? Is that what, what they're alluding yeah, to? Yeah, I, I think they, yeah. they are. I think what filler words means for me is that you're stretching it way beyond um, what is necessary for the person to understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So I've uh, I used the word the a lot before, and I remember now after someone caught me and and I was writing something uh, uh, in an article, and a, and a colleague of mine said, "Well, we don't need the every time on all of this stuff. It was just simple kind of correction." But it made sense, and all of a sudden I'm starting to say, "Do I really need this phrase? Do I need this uh, repeated so many times?" So. Yeah, it's kind of it's an interesting idea, I think. Um, all right, well, that's probably as much as we need to spend on this. But I wanted to, to just uh, uh, share with the people with you, but also the people watching, that this Mother Jones style guide is a it's out is, there. is a great little uh, handy uh, way to uh, correct and improve your writing, if you will. So, well, I like uh, it better than than I like Turabian or MLA or APA because it just uh, it seems updated I and I think it's because well, yeah. it's journalistic right is that yeah is that and, maybe and there, why? if they're a, a print um, uh, in, a, in a publishing house then I think they don't want to be called on these kind of things and so they do the research to look at what is accepted now what is the usual way to phrase things and to kind of move toward that so as a writer and that's back to where we started out yep. here. Uh, you may write a nice paragraph, but if that editor comes along and says, mm, uh, Tom, this thing could be two sentences instead of six, uh, you've got to figure out how to, to change that and make it into the way it should be. So uh, we need those style guides. We need to be paying attention to these things so that we're not just – floating a lot of filler and a lot of words out there that really don't get to the point those those writers that are succinct and get to it this goes back to another thing we are skimming and moving and not reading as much this is jeff conklin's uh one of his buttons but we're not readers anymore across the board out in society like we should be and therefore we're if we're reading less then it, we need to get to the point faster. That that writer needs to get the information to us because now uh, we're skimming so many web pages and and uh, all of the things that we that me, that that are in the media that are coming at us. We read the headlines. We read the first paragraph. If we go that far, would so Conklin have agreed with that, or would he have said we? 
that's wrong, that what we need to do is we need to w- – would he have called BS on that like he yes, does? Yes, he, you know? he would. Yeah, you know he, he's called it on me multiple times. He's called times, it on me. And so. he's called it on you. And so, yeah, he probably would because he thinks that – and I'll paraphrase and just make this up so he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> but I will say that, uh, yeah, he, he thinks we should be reading. He thinks right. we all should be uh, getting the, a better education and reading things to a certain extent that uh, – that uh, we uh, are more informed and we're critical thinkers and make better decisions. But, and this is the. Uh, so, wherein is the truth? Because the, the truth is also that there is so much more to contend with in terms of information. Like, just think of yeah. after Gutenberg, I mean, you had the Bible. So, yeah, you could read in depth if you could read. Uh, that's you right. Could read in you had depth to get up Because that's the, all there was to read, right? <laughs> that's right. And but yet, now there's so much. And when it's I. It's coming at us too fast, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody says, have you read the latest Pinker? Have you read the latest uh, Malcolm Gladwell? No. 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 I mean, he's got 70 books he put out last year or, you know, it's like everybody's an Asimov, Asimov, you know, Yeah. Well, six books a year or whatever he used to do. Well, here's the other thing. And I'll quote Jeff again, that um, 84 point or 85 percent of the uh, population is average or below. And and the second thing that I've heard <laughs> lately, and this is – I'm sorry, that's, what, that's one of his quotes. I have it written down here somewhere but because uh, he uses that bell-shaped curve on the IQ. The test and so forth. <laughs> but the, but the uh, notion – In a I, sense, and I And we're get throwing it, him know. under the bus. But anyway, one more thing is that <laughs> but, 80% um, of the population have high school education or, lo- or less. So it kind of fits with that. Now that's a pet peeve from him, and I shouldn't be arguing his points here. But, but the but the idea that we're reading less is uh, critical to how we make good decisions for ourselves. And here's our the thing, though. Here's the thing I found, and I've especially found it since I don't spend much time with academics anymore. You know, when I when I spend time, I spend it with uh, uh, trades folks and contractors and uh, folks who are out there doing hands on kind of work. And here, and, and a lot of them are high school graduates and maybe some sure. uh, uh, licensure. Listen, type. and I don't think this is a put down for any of those right. folks. He's just saying, hey, if but here's you the thing. had that skill, then yeah. Here's the point, though. A lot of those folks are the deepest thinkers I know. <laughs> And they come up with the most creative approaches. And a right. lot of times when pundits say, well, I predict uh, uh, so-and-so is going to win a, an election, right. it's because they haven't got a clue of what the American politic, body politic actually thinks. Right. Because they've not given time to go out and talk to the guy who uh, – you know, is doing your pest control. Well, he's a guy with a family who's earning a living, who's running a business, and probably reads a lot. And those people, uh, I found... They've been discounted. Are you saying that? And, yeah, and, in a way, right? And they're well-read. That's the, that's the thing that that's cool. I, I think... Otherwise, publishing would have gone out of business. So it's not college graduates going to Barnes & Noble. It's everyone right, or going right. to Amazon or whatever. And people read, and they develop their own point of view. I, it just uh, as an aside. Sure, man. So I, I went to a barber shop. Okay. And, uh, I was, uh, Great conversations in barber shops. You never know what you're going to hear. But here's the thing. There was a uh, – what's the word? Zeitgeist? The, okay, the, that's the word, yes. There was a zeitgeist there. There was a – a point of view and people gravit who gravitated toward that barbershop women and men right uh sort of had a point of view about politics and it was very uh it was very free-ranging okay and it was very uh very creatively sarcastic in a fun sort of way all right all right and i think that many people who are pundits or many people in politics have no idea what's said in a barbershop not a clue so when when they're making these pronouncements and thinking hey everybody's buying the the kool-aid that i'm selling (laughs) i I think a lot of people are out there going yay 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 but uh you know there's a there's a you you know I, i think a lot of times that people forget that and and again, it goes to yeah. who yeah. are you interested in, and what are you interested in? If you're just interested in uh, 
uh, you know, uh, I'm an academician and this and that kind right, of thing. And right, it's right. easy to get caught in that bubble, right? Oh, yeah. I, I remember very well at Auburn when I, I made the comment about I would like to write so that everyone, you know, I'd write in style, a particular style, and I, I got uh, – I got criticism from a particular professor who says, no, this is not for the general public. This is for the academicians, and you need mm-hmm. to write at that level. Uh-huh. And I thought, wow, what am I – what? Okay, I'm leaving out so many people I'd love to reach with these ideas. But uh, So you're right. That's a, that's a great example of it. And the people are also – it's almost the vat in the brain walking around on the shoulders of a lot of people. And <laughs> if I could make a crazy analogy, but but the idea yeah, that right. that you <laughs> and it gets back to confirmation bias. You know what you know, and ha- being open to learning something new. If that's not in uh, your skill set, then you think whatever you think is right, and that's the way it is, and that's how you interpret the world until yeah. you open up and maybe get into a group. And and as we, you just pointed out with uh, our great friend Jeff, who may may not ever come back to the studio after he hears this, but he, but uh, you know it, it, you have to be open to uh, the opposite point of view. You have to hear. Uh, the argument against your idea in order to really fully appreciate it. Then you can decide if you've heard all these arguments, right? So I I, got to say, uh, calling BS on things, hey, that's not such a bad thing. No, I think think it's good. I think Jeff adds so much to conversation because uh, because, uh, especially when I have a tendency to go off on some kind of (laughs) theoretical astro travel that I I can do, you know, or I've had too much coffee, Jeff will kind of reel me in and say, whoa, bro, uh, what are you talking about? And then I go, I don't know. know, I'm lost, Let me think about it before I – yeah, well, we do appreciate him. And I've enjoyed this conversation today. This has been kind of cool. We – you know, you, you accuse us of kind of coming in with no topic and no focus and we just ramble. I've heard you say that. I'm calling BS on that because I think what happens is we do have an idea. And and at times what we do is to bring in, in a spontaneous way, what we know about it and questions that we have about whatever that topic is. And today it was about writing. So let me ask you as we wrap up today, this idea of – and you're, you're – you told me that you are now writing a yep. book. I have a plan to write yeah, I'm working a book. On, I'm working on a couple things. With, with, yeah. a, with a co-author, One, but also yeah. something on your own, I think. Yeah, I've, so, I've got a couple things I'm working on. Yeah. All right, so let me let me just ask, um, what's what's your process for sitting down? And we used the analogy earlier of the Chevy Chase with the word the, and he never could get past that. Uh, what's your approach to it uh, when you say, okay, I, I feel passionate about this topic or this is the idea. I want to write about it. Where do you start with that? I, for me, it's only two things. It's okay. really a simple process, so it's not even a process. First, if I don't set a regular writing time, it oh, doesn't happen. Yes, yes, and it, yes. And it's great. ideal to if, – if it's a priority, then it's got to be when it's a high-energy time, so whatever works okay. for you. Uh, you know, that's, when I was great. when yeah, I was a younger great. writer, it was the middle of the night with a, a six pack of beer. Right. Uh, these days, it's <laughs> like days. five in the morning. You know, and okay. when I've still got any kind, anything left, any kind of energy left, that's the first thing. And the second right. thing, and it goes to your point about too many these, too many ands, too mm-hmm. much uh, ketchup stretcher in your <laughs> right. in your uh, what. Something I learned, uh, I've had many incarnations, I think, as a writer and a wannabe writer. You know, I was the uh, creative writer. I was an English major and all that. And then I became a, a, a wrote in a administrator ease. And then, you know, I've done all kinds of different things. So mm-hmm. I, we were talking about style guides. I've had all kinds of different style guides. But one of the things I learned in a, in a creative writing course as an undergrad is write down all that stuff. Yes. Put it aside, then come back with a pencil and cross out about half of it. Right. So that it, first impulse 
is to get it out there, but you need to come back to it later and make well, some. Well, bro, you're just jamming. It's not really a solo. You oh, take the okay. jam and you craft it into a solo that will fit in. music analogy. It'll in fit into it. It'll fit into a three minute deal that you could put on the radio. <laughs> you know, there's only so many people that want to go see a jam band, right? Right, right. And sometimes right, right, the right. jam's happening, sometimes it's not. Sometimes stream of consciousness is good, sometimes it's not. So. Uh, yeah, that long guitar solo that uh, the the guitar thinks it's the best thing ever. Not sure the audience is appreciating it that in that level all the time. Yeah, well, the bass player is ready to pull the plug on a guy. You know, he's <laughs> looking at the singer saying, "Kick that plug out of the wall, Art." So you, you know, he'll think his amp's broken, or maybe he won't notice. He right? won't notice. He's yeah, in his yeah. own world. Yeah, but that whole that whole idea because there's two things. First. Yeah. The first time out, you you don't want to get in your own way by second guessing everything you're putting down. This right. is me now. It's not no everybody. no no. That's a that's a very good point because that that's the block right there, yeah. and you have to free form it at the start. You have to just say, hey, there we're we're not choosing the final draft here. We're throwing we're brainstorming and throwing everything out there that comes to mind. Then you can go back and do something. With yeah it. yeah. First be. Stay out of your own way and just lay something out, even if it's rotten. Right. And then right. second, later on when you come back to revise, be vicious and fierce. Yeah, you got to cut it. With you? the reader in mind, what are you trying to accomplish yeah. for the reader? If it's just if you're just jamming, you know you're entertaining yourself. You might as well be sitting there at midnight with a guitar and uh, nobody hearing it, right? Man, I've had uh, th- this all brings back so much. And in, in, uh, when I think of our, my university career, that we're in those meetings where people are just stuck in a <laughs> sentence and a word in a sentence that they're going to do a policy or an administration. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're going to write something as a as a as a policy to use. That you get stuck on that and forget the bigger concept of what you're trying to do so uh guilty as charged but i'm also blaming some of those other folks that never could get away from that single focus on down to the point that you missed the bigger bigger picture incidentally you mentioned someone uh in a text or maybe it was an email a, a few mm-hmm. days ago it was mm-hmm. a colleague of ours virginia causey mm-hmm. oh yes got her uh fantastic her I'm great book it. her great book did is, you get a copy of that uh, i i i read it Okay. I think when she first published oh, it, yeah. Oh, okay, there you go. It, she's Fantastic. a wonderful writer, but but a lot of the things we're talking about, she's absolutely great at. Because I've worked on projects with Virginia, and she mm. is uh, – I'd love to get her in here on Skype and, and uh, talk with her. I don't know if she's still living in Columbus or she's out in oh, yeah, Montana she, or well, somewhere. Uh, there, no, right? she they travel, but you know she's married to Tim Chetwood, yeah. the the newspaper columnist. Sure. And, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, they're around. And But the thing about Virginia is – uh, I worked with her on in the early days of online learning. She and I were on the online learning committee okay. when when all of a sudden distance learning skyrocketed right, at Columbus right, State. Right, we right. were on we were that committee. We still have right? to go back and talk about that whole evolution in, yeah. in education and what it means. So that now we don't even yeah. think about that. But right. I remember Virginia teaching about that, and this is just a quick story about her. I went and attended. I guess it was her either her rite of passage, or I can't remember what it right. was. It may have been a rite of passage. Rite of passage where a professor reaches full professorship, and uh, yeah, does <laughs> she a had the best slide of all, you know. And she was doing a lot of distance learning. You mentioned Montana. She goes right. travels to Montana, but still teaches at Columbus State. Oh, right? she okay, was doing there you that. go. That's yeah, she did that right. summers. So uh, she was talking about distance learning, and at that time mm-hmm. it was very controversial and very highly criticized and debated right. and all that. And Virginia, who was a very popular professor and very popular with everyone at Columbus State at that time, she said, you know, <laughs> I'll never forget this. She said, the critique on distance learning is it isn't of high caliber because we're not there engaging the students. She says, but you know what? I really believe that when we go into class, we're under the illusion we're engaging everybody when really they're thinking about their next party or whatever. She right, works to right. That oh, yes, he brought it back down there. I then. fell off my chair because, you know, Virginia's so serious. Yeah. But that was such a great line. And yeah, that's, sense, she's, a, right? she's a great thinker. But getting back to her writing, yeah, I'm, I'm still she, reading scores, she scores on all 
levels with her writing. She's a great writer. Really um, entertaining book, and uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about it. I'm glad you've read it because I'm, I'm just into it a little bit there, and great stories about Columbus and development and all that. And I'd love to have her on the podcast and we could talk about it. If not, maybe you and I can bounce it around a little bit and we'll send her a link. But, I tell you uh, what, I'd love to just sit at a lunch with her and Tim. They, you know, uh, her oh, they're husband's fascinating a hoop. people, yeah, right? He's great. He's funny. Yeah, he's a funny fantastic. guy. Tom, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this today. It's always good, my friend, to have this conversation. Uh, let's do this more often. What do you think? All right. Well, you had some technology things you wanted to, uh, you know, look at, and uh, and I'm always ready to tackle that beast. That, Listen, and, and, that scary beast technology. Yeah, I tell you right. what, technology. I got your technology. But on the other hand, yeah, we've 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 got to uh, tackle that just a little bit because, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm reading this book. The future is coming faster than you think. So. You know, we've got to talk about what that means in terms of that convergence that they spend a lot of time in that book about. I haven't finished it yet, but when we do, we're going to have to talk about it. We're hovering like flies over the windshield. That's what the band Genesis would say. Okay. Yeah. My friend, it's been a pleasure. Listen, um, let's stop there. I'll see you next time. Great.